Welcome back to the 194th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including how the desk clerk has taken over the academy, a.k.a. the university system, how there's a current war against uh, faith in the adoption system and how it could be detrimental towards kids that need to be adopted. And our final story is talking about the Fox News uh, terrorist scandal that went on there for a little bit. And we will also end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So is there any reform that you could bring or anybody could bring to the american university that could actually bring it back to its heyday we used to love the american university people used to come all from all across the world to come to american university we had great research programs we had great public private partnerships and it just feels as though university is not exactly what it used to be it used to be a place to foster knowledge and to come into yourself as a person while also expanding your world, and giving you an insight into things that you had never thought of before. And while all of those things can still be true, the university itself feels on a grand scale like it's weighed down by a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of bloat. Uh, No longer can you just go and say, hey, I'm going to create a club. I'm going to make this club to get this community together. It's okay, I'm going to create this club. Now i got to fill out this paperwork. Now i got to go through this. i got to get this approved. i got to make sure that everything we want to do would be sanctioned by the university. And, of course, there are good reasons for that. There are probably some incidents that happened in the past that require the university to say, hey, okay, this club kind of went off the rails. But there are other things that kind of hinder the creative ability of students. And not just clubs, but other things as well, certain projects that would just be off the table where they couldn't do it because, well, no, you know, it doesn't fall within the purview of our department. Uh, I can't get you the approval for it, blah, blah, blah. There are definitely more guardrails up in the university. And is there something that you could do, you could think of doing, to change it? Because I think it's a very important question to really stimulate. Because as we go into this next chapter of American life, you know, we're 20 years into the 2000s. We have another 80 to go. We can really define this century based on the people that go to college and how these colleges actually help shape them as they come into the world. So we want to make sure that we have the best university system possible, especially as attendance for women is going up, even though attendance for men is falling. So our first article comes from Counterpunch. Quote, the rise of the desk clerk in academia. So as we discussed, I went through a few different things. You know, the daily debate kind of lets us frame this one so you understand where I'm coming from. And this author is trying to get at the idea here that it's not just, you know, the people who are admin workers that they're worried about, but more the desk clerk worker within each department, you know, deans, associate deans, adjunct professors. And they're they're kind of treating the academic world like an academic version of the corporate world, where it's kind of a corporate ladder where you're trying to get the next thing, you're trying to get the next promotion, uh, the next grant, the next... Uh, little bit of money so you can uh, either keep your position get a better position you could put on your resume and they're saying that it kind of whittles down the academic experience and the point of being a intellectual to something that is not actually benefiting anybody within the system and anybody outside of the academic system as well and they have a pretty verbose intro here so i'm just going to read the introductory paragraph Quote, it's a particularly quotidian breed in the modern management-driven university. The desk clerk who pretends to be an academic and researcher, but is neither. The desk clerk who admires the rosters, who plans and key performance indicators, thinks that the process of knowledge is quantifiable by productivity charts and financial returns. The desk clerk who pilfers the work of undergraduates, sports a dubious doctoral thesis and who rarely sets foot within the sacred surrounds of a library. The rise of such a figure in the global university scene, one neither fish nor fowl, is no accident. So what they're getting at here is someone who doesn't actually participate in the academic process for the sake 
of academic exploration, but rather, like I said, try to give it a corporate mindset. They're trying to quantify everything. They're trying to chart and graph everything. They're trying to say, okay, hey, uh, well, this productivity equals uh, two hours where they were not being as productive as possible, so we need to readjust our statistics here so we can actually verify that we can get the funding from our financial backers, because there is an interesting thing, which is the incentive system. Uh, the way you present information to backers, or normally a lot of funders for universities are alumni, and their, uh, their feeling for how the university helped shape them is enough to keep them coming back giving money. But for different grants and different uh, private grants, you know, government grants, you have to be able to quantify certain statistics. And for some people, those alumni, they don't necessarily have that feeling. They want to have quantifiable data saying, ah, okay, so anybody who goes into this program, 75% of them actually graduate, 62% of them come out with a uh, high paying job, blah, 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 these sort of statistics. And it's a very corporate mindset. So then, the person that is in academia in order to facilitate all of these things is going to have a similar mindset. And I'm not saying that it's purely incentives because there's also the idea that, well, you can still talk about all of these things and kind of be uh, philosophical about it and probably sell it just as well. But there are probably also people who went in there and started doing it in a very quantifiable way. They started talking about it in a very corporate way, and that seemed to resonate, and that's why some of these positions continue to uh, – be offered to people who thought that way and presented information in that way. So it could be chicken or egg. I don't know which one necessarily started first in this case, but the point is these sort of people who are using these statistics rather than trying to actually expand academic freedom and trying to take off the blinders and the limiting rails on a student's journey and a department's journey. No, they are right there at the top of the department saying, no, 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 we have to follow these particular lines. And the author goes into a little bit more about what that actually means. Uh, so, like I said, they're neither fish nor fowl. Uh, quote, as universities have declined, bureaucracy has bubbled with furious enthusiasm. The decline of teaching and its quality is complemented by the rise of the paranoid pen pusher and spreadsheet artist. With a decline in the substantive learning, the emergence of soft, watered-down syllabi, diminished reading list, how dare one expect students to read one book per subject, let alone a few journal articles, an increased focus on entertainment, flickering videos, uh, pleas. The desk clerk has become sovereign, dominant, and terrifying. Shallow, weak, insepid. Such beings occupy a particular space of decline, subsidized by the towelers who put in hours in often shabby conditions, but the casual or sensational workforce that is particularly acute. So, wow, I mean, that's, that's not a modern indictment of anybody there. He's definitely not calling out students and teachers and the bureau bureaucratic system at all. Um, so can we actually, I want to take a step back to expecting a, a student to read one book a subject. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they probably should. There should probably be one book that you're reading in every single class, whether it's a lit book, whether, wait, sorry, whether it's a lit class, whether it's a poli-sci class, whether it's a business class. There are plenty of books to read on all of those different topics. And very seldom was that the case in a lot of my business classes. Uh, of course, we had to read the actual book for the class, but an outside book with a different perspective, nah, very seldom was that the case for most of my business classes. There were a few where we had to, there was one where we had a project where we had to choose a book to read, but that's different than having an assigned book that uh, everybody reads together and they explore and they talk about the different topics and things like that. But what the author's trying to get at here is this is not solely the desk clerk who is the problem, but the desk clerk has helped slowly facilitate some of these problems that have come up rather than pushing back against this stagnation, this lowering of standards, uh, they've actually helped, not accelerate it, but they've actually helped facilitate it. They have made it so that, okay, hey, these students need these particular things. You know, they're all coming to me. They're talking to me, if you're talking about a dean. They're all talking to me about some of these problems. Uh, we need to adjust something in order to help some of these students. And then they push new standards on the rest of the classes, on the rest of the student body in that particular department. 
and the dynamic has to shift things change and also they look around they say okay well universities are seeming to get a little bit easier on these students uh, but you know some of the, the stringent guidelines we had before they're not necessarily there anymore uh, maybe we need to shift things around i'm looking at the trends in our industry so once again it's that corporate mindset of oh hey well we don't want to discourage kids compared to the other universities uh, we want to make sure they feel welcomed we want to make sure this program works for them and our quantifiable metrics uh, well we don't want to lose students and if we want to have a high retention rate a high graduation rate then we need to adjust some of these standards and instead of thinking about it in the terms of an intellectual experiment and pushing the people to be the best intellectual intellectually they can it comes down to a numbers game once again so while i don't necessarily 100 percent agree with everything the author's getting at in this first quote mainly because i know some great deans uh, i know two specifically really great deans that were at my college that were giving all of us the they weren't necessarily babying us they were having a serious conversation they challenged us intellectually they wanted to keep on pushing and make sure that we were not being stagnant at least from my personal interactions with them but i do understand where they're coming from where if your job is to make things quantifiable things can get a little bit trickier because no longer can you just talk about the pure intellectual stimuli that used to be the grips of college no but you have to actually put it into numbers and these things these intellectual experiences are hard to put into numbers and at the end of the day you got to follow some of these trends because like i was talking about it's chicken egg i don't know which one did it first but the incentives are aligned in a very particular direction in order for you to keep your job and to keep on scaling up that ladder you do have to fold on certain things and then you implement some of the rule changes on the people below you as well and that goes back to the idea that i was talking about earlier where academia has been thought of as more of a career path to gain money and to stay in the field purely beyond being a teacher but in other areas as well kind of like a corporate ladder that you're just trying to climb and get to the top next thing you know you're no longer a dean but you're a president of a university and when you're president of the university you're not just running uh, a few classes you're also running the admissions program some of these different you're dealing with the board of certain uh, of your different board members all the time which kind of makes it feels like a corporation even if you're not a uh, not-for-profit college you know you see where i'm coming from so th the way things are structured uh, america has definitely gone in a very particular direction the american university has definitely gone in a particular direction so there's one more quotation that i want to read from this article specifically quote so where do we find these crawling creatures so menacing to learn and murderous to thought in the position of deans, associate deans, and their collaborating adjuncts, program managers on the make, colorless gutiers, humorless henchmen, women, and those in between hoping to make a buck or two out of the neurosis of identity politics. In the roles of directors of learning and teaching, universities are in a bad way if they need such areas. In sections with names resembling toilet cleaning products or caricogenic chemicals i'm sorry if i mispronounced that one these people are in turn given orders by nameless unaccountable individuals in the upper echelons of the institution crowned by the most unaccountable of officers the vice chancellor who usual corporate and commercial laws do not apply but be there in terms of renewable or government governance decisions so that one, that last little part, uh, usual corporate and commercial laws do not necessarily apply. They're, they're talking about the idea that once you become, not necessarily tenured, but once you become so embedded in the academic system, it is a little bit harder to kick you out. If you're in a corporate system and you, you, know, you really, really, really fail at your job, you don't hit your numbers, so on and so forth, then you're not always going to get fired, but you can very easily get fired. The turnover is good in a business arena very seldom are there people who are not replaceable but in the academic world he's trying to play on this idea that okay hey well no you can't fire me because he was that's why i brought up identity politics you can't fire me because of this this and this or people have made friends and they've become insulated the system works in a very particular way around them so you can't just fire them so that's why he's talking about the corporate rules that are normal under different circumstances don't necessarily apply here 
So we need to really reframe how we think about these colleges. We need to reframe how we think about some of these different positions. All Are all of the positions in the a academy necessary? Think about it that way. If we can cut them, like he said, do we really need a director of learning and teaching? Or a director of learning and a director of teaching? Like, do, do you really need those there? No, you need competent teachers and competent department heads who are going to uh, steer the department the different majors in a very particular way and even then it should be down to an individual teacher not guidelines provided to them because each teacher is going to teach differently anyway so why hinder that let them speak their how should i say speak the best that they are able to teach the best that they are able to and if it resonates with some students those students will gravitate towards them and other students will gravitate towards other people this academic freedom that used to exist allows pure exploration and that allows for pure curiosity to take hold rather than having limited rails limiting rails on students when they go through the university because like i said it's the time of exploration it's a time of finding yourself of exploring what different intellectual avenues you can take and if those are limited if they're cut off before you e can even go down them you are l it's an opportunity cost basically you don't know that you're necessarily missing out on something that you could have loved because the department said you can't do it but you are or the possibility is at least there so we need to reevaluate what's going on in the academic world because it used to be one of the most loved here in America we had lots of people coming from all over the world and that may stop happening here soon especially with the decline in college attendance of our own generation as well all right so let's jump to our second article that comes from the Washington Examiner Biden's war on faith and family continue so you may have heard about some of the legislation the rules it's not actually legislation because it didn't go through Congress some of the rules that Biden is bringing down on different adoption agencies of faith. Well, I take that back. Adoption agencies, and it's going to affect a lot of adoption agencies of faith because they don't necessarily endorse his social agenda. So uh, let's just go to a quote because if you haven't heard about it, they can explain it better than I can, and then we can actually talk about it afterwards. Quote, pushing back against the Biden administration's radical identity politics, 19 states' attorney generals and numerous conservative and religious organizations last week stood up for the religious liberty and for longstanding effective child adoption services. Good. The Biden proposal at issue is pernicious. As succinctly put by Advancing American Freedom, a think tank founded by former President, Vice President Mike Pence, the proposal would, quote, violate the religious freedom of foster care families and ultimately make the shortage of families working within the foster care system worse, end quote. November 7th was the deadline for comments about the, quote, safe and appropriate foster care placement requirements, a rule proposed by the Biden, Joe Biden's administration for children and family which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. And it is yet another manifestation of the left's obsession with sexual behaviors and identities. It would prevent states from using children adoption agencies, most of them faith-based, that do not accept leftist dogma about clothing choices and pronouns for children in foster care who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning intersex as well as children who are non-binary or who have non-conforming gender identity or expression. End quote. So... What is all of that actually getting at? The rule is put in place to make sure that people that do not accept the child as they are are not allowed to adopt them. And the thing that's really interesting about this is it, it can be much more broad than it actually is right now. It's not necessarily, because right now it seems to indicate directly, okay, hey, if this person claims to be LGBTQIA+, whatever you want to say, whatever the acronym is nowadays, if they claim to be this, then you can't put them in a household that doesn't necessarily, that won't affirm them, that won't agree with them. And, you know, maybe I could see the argument there. Uh, if these students are going through a hard time and, you know, they're being bullied for their LGBTQI identity, and a lot of people who are LGBTQIA believe that they're being bullied, to believe they're social outcasts, do you necessarily want to put them in a place where they're not going to be accepted and comfortable, and they're going to feel like they're not loved, even though the parents can show all the love in the world, but if they don't affirm them, they might not feel like they're loved? Probably not. But what's interesting here 
is I think that it will actually extend further. I think this rule will go further beyond just the people that already identify as LGBTQIA+, but they're going to start asking these families or these adoption families and these adoption agencies, well, does this family believe in this at all? Because you don't know if your, your son or daughter that you're going to be adopting is actually going to one day identify as LGBTQIA+, and we need to limit the possibility that they are stressed if they ever do do that. I could very well see that rule being applied in this fashion, not just exactly as the conditions are now, but trying to protect or in their mind, protect the child in the future. And that's what's really, really dangerous. Because what? I believe it's one-fourth of uh, students nowadays in uh, middle schools or high schools are identifying as LGBTQIA+. So that still leaves three-fourths of people that, are, if we apply that statistic to people that are in the foster care system, just you're, we're making a broad generalization, that still leaves three-fourths of people who can be adopted with no problem whatsoever by some of these groups underneath this rule. But then if the agency says, well, wait, we don't want to have this in the future, we don't want them to be distressed, uh, we should actually protect against this in the future as well so that they can find a loving home where there won't be any problems. And first off, you're never going to find them a perfect home that's never going to have any problems, but I could very well see this rule being implemented in that way. And honestly, th the thing is, this is just a way to mandate their agenda. Whether or not you agree with it, whether or not I agree that you probably don't want to put a, a person who feels like they're an outcast in a place that won't necessarily accept their way of thinking, even if I don't agree with their way of thinking, this is just a way for a certain presidential administration to say, you can't participate in a normal process. You can't participate in this process of adopting a child. If you can't have children, you can't participate in this process of adopting a child. You can't participate in this normal practice that has allowed many families to bring in new people into their lives and allowed these children to have homes where they are loved. You can't participate in that because you don't agree with my view of the world. You don't agree with my belief system. You don't see it the same way I do, so therefore you can't participate in this normal social activity, essentially. And I think that is just absolutely disgusting. It's basically saying, hey, it's my way or the highway, and at the end of the day, uh, you're not going to get the highway. You're going to get my way, basically. Because this is a government mandate. And if a state really, and let's be clear, the 19 states are going against it. There are plenty of other states that won't necessarily enforce it. But there are states that are going to say, hey, well, hey, hands off. You know, well, we would love for you to have this kid, but ah, this rule from the federal government, they can use it as a cloak and dagger to push their own agenda forward and prevent these people from actually having the ability to love a child and provide a life for them or providing the child with a stable, loving household. And that is just outrageous. The fact that you could let your belief system stop you from providing a place for children who have lost probably everything or who have never had anything besides the foster care system. You're keeping from them the ability to be loved, the ability to have a house where they can grow and be strong and build true connections and learn to trust properly. Come on. It's outrageous. It's despicable. And I don't care if it's because I don't care if it was a religious group that wasn't allowed to do this or it was just some other group that doesn't necessarily another adoption agency that doesn't necessarily say, oh, we're going to affirm all the kids. I don't care if it's a whole bunch of lefties who don't agree. I don't care what your ideology is. If you are affected by this and you're not allowed to adopt children because of it, it's despicable because adopting a child and being a person who chooses to adopt a child. Yes, there are people who are a drag on the system. They are foster parents, and they do it just for the money, and they're despicable. But a lot of these people that want to adopt children, they are loving, they are caring, and they are genuinely good people who want to give back to the world, or they want to be able to raise someone because they haven't been able to do it themselves, and they want to sacrifice just a little bit of their life in order to help make a child's life better. And those are the great people in our society. Those are the loving, caring people in our society. And saying that if you don't agree with them politically, you're going to shut them down. You're going to stop them from spreading the love that they want to so badly. Like I said, absolutely despicable. And we shouldn't be having any of this. There are plenty of other quotes from this article. But, you know, I think that actually that's all the summary that we need to go into. The rest of it is the fine details of how many uh, different religious organizations are out there for adoptions in different states. 
but uh, I think you kind of got where I'm coming from. You understand why this is some BS, honestly. And like I said, there's a place to understand it from, even if I don't 100% agree with the reason they're doing it. But I think if you do a pro-con list, that con is greatly, greatly outweighed by all the other pros. All right, so let's jump to our final article that comes from Salon. <sighs> this one is a... Uh, it's an interesting article, and I took a little bit of time to let this one play out when I saw some of the news stories, and I had to cultivate what I think about it. And Salon did an article that would actually allow me to express the opinion I have on this while giving some crucial information. Quote, the headline reads, Irresponsible. Fox News cites fake terrorist attack 97 times and then used it to vilify Muslims. End quote. So if you remember the attack, quote-unquote, the uh, car that ran into the Canadian border in the United States, and they were claiming, ah, oh, it was a bomb, it was attacked, and then it turned out, no, it, it wasn't attacked, it was just people driving super crazily and things like that, and it, it kind of blew over within a week and a half, you know, it was right before Thanksgiving, and I kind of let this one sit, I was like, okay, now this is, like, we don't know if it's an attack yet, we don't have all the information, give it a little bit, I thought maybe it's a possible, but I don't necessarily see it happening, uh, Fox News is kind of running with it, maybe, but um, actually, hold on, I'll just go to a quote here to give you the author's perspective on it, because if you heard of this story, you know where I'm coming from, and if you haven't heard of this story, once again, the author can provide some good context here, quote, Fox News personalities and guests made at least 97 claims alleging or speculating that a car accident at Rainbow Bridge in Niagara, New York last week was an act of terrorism, generating a fabricated narrative about Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians and their supporters being responsible for the incident Media Matters found. Now, let's be clear. I don't like Media Matters, and Media Matters is just trying to drag Fox News. And I understand when I hear something coming from them, I understand the perspective that it's coming from. It's not necessarily just pure reporting, but it's actually normally uh, attacks and drags on the media. But, you know, they did do all the research here. They did look through all the videos and get all the counts of everything. So that's why they're cited here. Quote, the network aired the false claims on screen for hours, speculating that the car crash at the U.S.-Canada border was an act of terrorism relying mostly on reporting from correspondent Alexis McAdams who attributed her information to anonymous law enforcement sources, end quote. And the reason that this is so important to talk about, in my opinion, is because it validates people's preconceptions. The idea that there was going to be an attack on our country, a terrorist attack, was being talked about by many media figures after uh, Palestine and Israel, that whole thing took off. There were lots of Palestine rallies. We were talking about the open borders down at the south, how we don't know who's coming through the border. They could come here to attack us, so on and so forth. And then something happened that looked a little bit odd. You know, we don't see a large explosion at the border every single day. And all it took was one nugget of information, one nugget to confirm their point of view, not more intensive research, and then they just ran with it. And it's not just Fox News, MSNBC, CNN does it as well. Remember Covington? Remember the Covington kids? Yeah, okay, all of these different stories were little bits of information that confirmed everybody's bias, and then they ran with it rather than doing more intensive research. And eventually they folded, but it doesn't mean that they fully declared themselves. I mean, the article goes on to talk about how uh, McAdams walks it back, but kind of tentatively saying, oh, well, no, this was the information we were given. It doesn't mean it was 100% accurate, but we were going with what we knew at the time rather than saying, no, no, we were wrong. Sorry to screw up. So that's why I wanted to highlight this story. That's why I wanted to bring this one up, because even if you don't like Media Matters for their dragging of conservative outlets, they did the little bit of research here. They found all the instances where the Fox News anchors and uh, different guests speculated about this, and they just ran with the narrative. Now, 97 times, honestly, isn't as much as some other stories uh, that have been out there before that have run for longer and then uh, silently killed once they realize it doesn't prove their point of view. But it's just another example of how we look for things that affirm our bias, and then from there we fill in the gaps. So we need to be careful, and especially the reader. The reader and listener needs to be more skeptical than the journalist. The journalist was supposed to be the skeptical one. That was supposed to be their role. They are the skeptical ones, so they give you the information as it is, all the facts, they lay it out, 
but that's not where we live in anymore. We live in an entertainment economy. They're trying to keep your eyeballs. So now you have to be the one that's skeptical. And even if you trust the journalist, give it a little bit of time to breathe. All right, so let's jump to our final article, our daily delight that comes from Upworthy. Rut, the moose, has caught the attention of 40,000 people following his every move. So if you don't know about Rut, he is a viral animal that has been migrating between Iowa and Minnesota. And Minnesota it has lots of great things, but honestly, Rut seems to be the most popular one right now, at least on the social media uh, Facebook. Quote, apparently there's a moose who has got gone loose in central Minnesota. Not only has it gone loose, but it has also made everyone crazy about it. The moose also has a name, Rut, and a Facebook page called Rut the Central Minnesota Moose on the Loose. And I mean, come on, that's just a great name. Uh, that, that is just a great name, 100%. Um, so the page, it's gotten lots of attention. You know, it's keeping uh, lots of people entertained with his movements and things like that. Uh, there is a little bit more about how it actually works, though. Quote, ever since then, the page has been used as a map to find out the moose's location. The page urges people not to mention, you know, to mention general areas where the moose has been spotted, as opposed to exact locations for safety reasons. Not just that, they have also advised that people do not compromise their safety to get close to the moose and take a picture, uh, because their safety is a priority. But if you ever see them and you can get close enough and, you know, at a safe distance, you know, maybe you have a nice long telephoto lens and you can grab some close-up pictures or what appear to be close-up pictures, Go right ahead, post it on that Facebook page if you live in Minnesota. Uh, just, you know, keep track of this little guy because he seems to be really entertaining. And also, I mean, come on, like I said, uh, Rut the Moose on the Loose in Minnesota. Like, central, come on, that's a great Facebook name. So if you want to see any of the cute photos of Rut or you want to find any of the links to his Facebook page or you want to read any of today's articles, all the links will be in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find a link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Podvine, as well as the Twitter handle at your daily flip, where I post a Twitter tirade every Tuesday or Thursday. A little bit less scripted, a little bit less formal, just kind of exploring ideas that uh, have culminated from reading or I've just thought about. So, with all that said, there's only one more thing to say: stay safe, don't die. <laughs>